and what we are seeing on the streets of Delhi or all over the country today with the Bharat Bam is a continuation of this exploitation. And to me, this is genocide. I've said it, I've been trolled by the Monsantos of the world, but when you deliberately harm a community and farmers are a community and you cause harm to the extent that 400,000 of them have to commit suicide, this is genocide and it has to stop. And I hope your networks will play their role to create another economy through a new solidarity. Um, so fast forward to the 1960s and 1970s, a critical juncture in India's agriculture sector was the Green Revolution. And Dr. Shiva, for those that are not familiar, can you give a brief overview of what the Green Revolution was for its benign name um, and what its impacts were that were not so green? So, you know, there was no green politics at that time. The, the word green did not mean ecology. Green was just a different color from red. And the Americans were very scared of it. <laughs> so uh, they just wanted a different name. Uh, the Green Revolution was not green. It was not revolutionary. It was basically an attempt being made ever since the wars ended to take war chemicals. The chemical fertilizers were basically made uh, in the same labs and same factories in which the explosives were made, the same IG carbon made nitrogen fertilizers and made explosives um, and the same process. Um, all of the pesticides are derivatives of xylon B and poison gases that were made again for Hitler's concentration camps and for the wars. So after the wars were ended, instead of just folding up and saying we'll shut these factories, they had got so addicted to making huge money and Rachel Carson has written about it in her book, uh, Silent Spring, um, Howard, uh, Albert Howard has written about it in his book, An Agricultural Testament, that uh, those who had got addicted to making money out of selling chemicals uh, continue to sell them now as agrochemicals. So the big issue was they wanted to sell fertilizers and chemicals. The problem was, uh, you know, Satyagraha is Gandhi's word for non-cooperation based on truth. And what, when chemicals were applied to our native varieties of seeds, which were tall because they were dual purpose. The straw gave food for the animals and the grain gave food for us. So we created dual purpose animals, milk from the cows and animal energy from the bullocks and dual purpose crops to feed the animals, including human animals. But when you apply chemicals to these tall crops, they lodge if there's wind or too much rain. And this problem of lodging was the big problem. So they kept trying Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, and then Norman Borlaug, who worked for DuPont Defense Lab, was put on the job of changing the plant to adapt to the chemicals rather than adapt the farming techniques to the native seeds. And that's why he created the dwarf varieties. And these dwarf varieties were misleadingly called high yielding varieties. How can less be more? You know? And when I did my Green Revolution book, my eyes would tell me, here's a lie, but my science will tell me, bigger lie. These were not high yielding variety. They were high chemical demanding varieties, high response varieties, but they needed 10 times more water to grow the same amount of food. And that's the root of the water crisis of Punjab for which the farmers are being blamed, but it was imposed on them. There were conditionalities put. If you couldn't show you had taken chemicals, you couldn't take a loan to send your daughter to college. Credit conditionalities on the farmer and on India, credit conditionalities from the World Bank. All of this also meant these short varieties came with mechanization and just the top of the grain was picked up by the harvester and the stubble was left and they told the farmer, burn the stubble. And now they told the farmer, use your water use the chemicals. They told the farmer, burn the stubble, and now they want to fine farmers 20 million rupees each for doing what they were told to do. So one of the demands of the farmers right now is this should not be criminalized. So the Green Revolution, what did it end up doing? And it was prescribed by the World Bank, it was conditionality. 65, we had a drought. The prices of wheat went up slightly. And those days we used to, under rupee payment, import a little extra rye wheat from uh, US, it was called the PL Poiti. And Lal Bahadur Shastri asked for a little more wheat. 
to stabilize prices. No one was dying of hunger and famine. There was no famine in India in 65. I was in school and I remember. Prices rose up. Sugar was a problem. And uh, the US said, sorry, we won't send you wheat unless you change your agriculture and use chemicals. And Shastri said, I will not experiment with such a large agrarian population. Uh, we can do it on a small scale and if it works, we'll adopt it. And then Lal Bahadur Shastri died in Tashkent, the pressure continued and the green revolution was imposed. By 91, we had structural adjustment because the debt of the green revolution for dams, for irrigation, for uh, chemicals, for, um, for the whole system. Now, actually, the system that was created was only P Punjab. If you think of it, Aditi, so during British time, the Punjab farmers refused to become serfs and stayed owner cultivators. By the time Green Revolution came, they said, we got to build on the best because this wasn't a destroyed agriculture. And then they started, started to destroy it. And as a result of that, by 1984, the farmers of Punjab resisting. 84 was a peasant movement. The narrative was changed, but it was a farmer's movement. And the farmers were saying, and I have it written here, the Shirumuni, you know, there was a declaration, I think, the Gurmat Khasla said, if the hard-earned income of the people or the natural resources of any nation or region are forcibly plundered, the goods produced by them are paid at arbitrarily determined prices, while the goods bought by them are sold at high prices. And in order to carry this process of economic exploitation to its logical conclusion, the human rights of people or of a nation are crushed, then these are indices of slavery of that nation, region, or people. Today, the six are shackled by chains of slavery. This type of slavery is thrust upon the states and 80% of India's population of poor people and minority. And we mustn't forget, my mother herself became a refugee. She, you know, she had studied in Lahore and was working in Lahore, and then the partition happened. The partition left only Sikh farmers. Earlier, there used to be a mixture because of the Sikhs moved this side and the Muslims moved that side. So the farmers of Punjab are Sikhs. And they communalized the farmers' protests. And every narrative, if you look at it, 84 story is never told in terms of the farmers. 4th of June, the farmers of Punjab are going to blockade the supply of grain to Delhi. They had blockaded the governor's house. They were going to blockade the trains. So the Green Revolution brought 84. Then the 91 is a buildup of the new reforms. And maybe we can come back to that on another round. I can quickly tell you that 80. 30% of the debt of 91, the 90 billion debt, was caused by the Green Revolution. And that then started to push new reforms, they call it, yeah, which is basically create a crisis, use it as an opportunity to expand your control and your market. And I want to show you just two images. So in 2000, I did a public hearing on farmer suicides. This was in Bangalore. This is a sick farmer who had come, whose brother has committed suicide because of debt. And that's not all. In 2006, this is still in my heart. It's still, I still carry this pain. You know, usually in Punjab, everyone's with a colorful turn, and all the women are in colorful chunis. This is all white. 2,000 widows in a Gurdwara in Batinda, giving evidence to us. We were on a jury, a public jury of a public trial. 2,000 widows. And all of them said, and then he took the spray, as a spray, you know, in Punjabi, a spray, yeah, the poison spray. They took the spray that got them into debt for the BT cotton. They were all BT cotton farmers. Vidharba suicides, Batinda suicides, all connected through the poison cartel. And what we are seeing on the streets of Delhi or all over the country today with the Bharat Bam is a continuation of this exploitation. And to me, this is genocide. I've said it, I've been trolled by the Monsantos of the world, but when you deliberately harm a community and farmers are a community and you cause harm to the extent that 400,000 of them have to commit suicide, this is genocide and it has to stop. And I hope your networks will play their role to create another economy through a new solidarity.